So welcome everybody to the Refold Roundtable podcast. So today, the podcast crew is going to discuss things that we regret, things that we don't regret, things that we would have done differently if we could go back in time and restart our language learning journeys. Cool, cool. So do you guys want to introduce yourselves? How about you, Brie? Go first. Sure. I am Brie, aka Brizzle. I am learning Spanish, and I've been learning Spanish for the past two plus years with Refold. Um, and I do social media things. That's my introduction. Did your journey Go. start with Spanish? No. Regrettably, because today is all about regret, right? Or Correct. if we could do things over. Uh, it did not start with Spanish. Well, in high school, many moons ago, like that a long count. time ago. That doesn't count. Okay. You cheated in it your high school classes. You just like barely Listen, scraped by. That's not I really did. I, that's language. what I'm saying. So in high school, I started with Spanish, but I didn't learn anything except for how to conjugate tener, tener. But that's it. Um, and the days of the week, because uh, our, our teacher had a really good song about it. Um, I tried French in college. I didn't cheat in college, um, but I did not do well. And um, I tried to learn languages on and off. And then a couple of years ago, well, about three or four years ago, I told myself, this is it. I'm, I'm learning a language. I'm going to go hard. I'm going to learn Japanese. I love anime. This is possible. I didn't know about immersion learning. I didn't know about any of that. So how I old were you that... when you like first started trying to teach yourself Japanese? Like for real? Uh, 30... How old am I now? Uh, like probably... I think you're 35. Okay. When I was 32. <laughs> Okay, so about three years ago. About three years ago, I thought, that's it. I'm going hard. I'm going to do Japanese. I found a Genki um, flashcard deck, and it was both production and recognition. Um, and I got through about and were you, probably 600 Were you just doing the flashcards? Or were you doing I was the doing the flashcards. Well? I was trying to do the book, but um, I had a really hard time staying focused on the book. <laughs> So I didn't really get through that too much, but I did RTK because I saw a video from Matt. So this is what got me started like down this whole immersion train was he had this video about RTK that he now disagrees with. But that's when got me into immersion learning. And I started doing RTK and I got through about 800 kanji when I finally just gave up. I rage quit. I learned about immersion learning and I just couldn't stomach the fact that I... Oh, I also did uh, three levels of Pimsleur with Japanese. Spoiler alert, I remember nothing. Like, close to zero. I remember close to zero of Japanese. And I decided to rage quit, slash and burn, and start fresh with Spanish. With immersion. So, I didn't start immersion hard with Spanish because I was still learning about it. Um, I started with Duolingo and watching dreaming spanish kind of like simultaneously and then after about like a month of getting bored with that i jumped into immersion and never looked back so that's my love story <laughs> that's right. my story the, the brief introduction um how about you <laughs> Not shiki? So brief. uh i'm shiki uh your favorite weeb on the uh, discord favorite japanese mod. network yeah. wow um, it'll be at the end of this month, it'll be a whole year of learning Japanese for me. Congratulations. My anniversary is coming. You have a love story too. Okay. Keep going. Yes. So, <laughs> uh, pretty much a lifelong weeb since I was pff, seven, eight years old. Whenever they started showing Dragon Ball Z back in the day. On uh, Toonami. So, so I've just Toonami been... was the start of your, your weepdom. Yeah. So it was the time when they were showing Dragon Ball Z and Sailor Moon and all that stuff. And, and to clarify, uh, Toonami was like the evening section of Cartoon Network in America, right? It was or actually like it was actually the early morning one. 
was like early it was morning. the early morning showing of oh, okay. anime oh. stuff. So I would watch it before going to school <laughs> in the morning, going nice. to elementary school. <laughs> and it was like you were it was like the two factions like in World of Warcraft, you were either a Sailor Moon person or you were a Dragon Ball Z person. And I was a Dragon Ball Z person because uh, I was a huge tomboy. Still am. But, Proud uh, of you. Yep. So I've been a weeb for a long, long time. And then they introduced the Adult Swim thing um, where they were showing Yu Yu Hakusho. And I fell in love with that. Love Yu Yu Hakusho. Very nostalgic. And uh, that got me more interested in the Japanese language because I was so obsessed with it. I was like, I'm going to consume Yu Yu Hakusho in every shape, way, form that I possibly can. So I watched the dub and I watched it in Japanese with English subs. So I was like, oh my God, Japanese is the best language ever. And yeah. But All right. like and a lot of people, you, I had... Them. When did you get into learning Japanese? So you got into Japanese because of anime when you were like young. And mm -hmm. then at what point did you say, hey, I'm going to like start learning Japanese. How did you get into learning Japanese, immersion learning? Well, like a lot of people, I was like, I want to learn Japanese, but didn't really know how to do it. And like my parents bought me kanji textbooks to try to learn kanji and stuff like that. But I got super bored and I went a long time not actually trying to learn it, just kind of passively consuming it because that was just the entertainment that I liked was anime and Japanese stuff, YouTube. Um, so I didn't take it in high school or anything. I took Spanish in high school. Um, but I was in the military. I was in the Air Force and I decided that I was going to separate. And knowing that I would have a lot of free time, I was like, okay, I'm going to learn Japanese for real, for real this time. And then I found, uh, you know, Matt versus Japan and got into the Refold network almost a year ago. All right. And what does separate mean, like in the context of uh, like the U.S. military? Yeah, it's like no longer being a member of the active duty military. So this is the point where you became like, what's it called? Backup? Like where you, I forget yeah, the term. I, reserve. I transferred reserve to the forces. reserve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And when you were active U.S. military, when you were in the Air Force, did you ever like think to take advantage of the DLI or anything? Like use the the U.S. government's dime to kind of like get good at a language? Or it sounds like you didn't get into language until after you separated. Yeah, I thought about the whole DLI thing and becoming a linguist in the military, but I heard all of the horror stories about um, the language school and how it was so hard and how it was basically trying to learn a language with a gun to your head. So I was like, uh, that doesn't sound I, like literally. a fun time. <laughs> so yeah. I was like, mm, no, thank you. It, it scared me. Um, I'd be scared and I'm actually kind of glad. I'm actually kind of glad because I feel like it would have like ruined my experience of language learning. Yeah. I can imagine that. Mm -hmm. So you separated us, from like, the Air Force. For and then you said, okay, I'm going to learn for real. So how did you get into it? Did you find Matt well, or what happened? Yeah. Well, before I found Matt, I was trying the whole app situation. Um, even back then, I knew that D Duolingo was bad. So I was like, I'm going to try a different one. I tried Lingo Deer, where I learned like the Kana and stuff uh, that way. But now, no hating on Lingo actual... Deer. I think it's a, a fan favorite. <laughs> I know that Brie will defend its honor. I think she has a lifetime account. Mm. I do indeed have a lifetime account to Lingo Deer. Yeah. And I will defend its honor. I think it's one of the better game fight apps. Uh, I really do. Yeah. yeah. For, you know, in the beginning, just to start to get a grasp on things so that your immersion is more comprehensible, I think Lingo Deer is great just because it has native audio, which compared to a lot of other apps, it doesn't. Mm. Yeah, that's true. And I think a lot of the vocabulary is actually useful. Um, and the, the main problem I have with Lingo Deer is that it's um, pretty repetitive and it always shows a translation. Mm. But if it didn't have that, I feel like it would be 
not terrible. Because the it's... problem I had li- with Lingo Deer was, yeah. um, it would tell you, you know, okay, here's some words. Here's mm-hmm. uh, some words to study, and then it would have like a lesson thing at the end where it was like a conversation between two. Oh, people. those were impossible in Japanese. Yeah, I tried that. Yeah, in Jap- those are in Spanish easy because you can read, you know, the Latin yeah. alphabet, so it's not so bad. But in Japanese, it's like, here's this kanji you've never seen before in your yeah. entire life. <laughs> I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? I skipped I, those. I didn't learn this. they were optional. I was like, yeah, whatever. I skip it. Yeah. So I think Lingo Deer inherited the Chinese skill Mandarin course. So I know that like um, that particular course is like really popular with the Mandarin learners over on uh, Refold Mandarin. So mm. I definitely oh. think there's a bit of a split here. The The Chinese learners definitely tended to start with an app. Um, mm-hmm. So I've got nothing bad to say about Lingo Deer. As you know, I think it's fine for an yeah. app. Like not, it's not going yeah. to teach you a language, but it's an okay start. Yeah. You have to go in with the expectations knowing that it's not going to get you fluent. It's not something that you should be spending all of your time on, but mm-hmm. to help get you acquainted with the language if you want to hear native audio and if you're someone who feels like you're you just can't progress without doing grammar then like that's like a good way to do it while getting like native audio and and learning through sentences Mm -hmm. you know um yeah i I like lingo deer so you you got lingo deer you you got into apps what happened next um I I don't know. I just felt like I wasn't getting anywhere, yeah. but I didn't really know how to get where I wanted to get until I um, decided to try immersion. And I tried watching K-On, uh, just like raw, no subs. And I was like, huh, I don't understand anything. That's funny. <laughs> uh, so I was like, this sucks. I'm not going to do this. And then later on, yeah. I, I did more rabbit hole digging into like, Matt's stuff and how he interviewed like other learners and finding other people's YouTube videos of them. Oh, I'm speaking Japanese for the first time after two years of that. Oh, wow. And I was like, well, crap. All right. Uh, I guess there's something to this. So I decided to actually give another chance and stick with it this time. And look at you almost a year later. Yeah. Yeah, and you got about, what, 500 hours or so in your first year? Or a bit more? Yeah, over 500. I'm, I think I'm close to 600 hours because I am also going to school, so I can't be a full-on age adder. Right, you, you got that. work, uh, immersion, yep. and then university. Mm-hmm. All right. Wow. Cool. And then I guess I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Gorg, Gorgonzola Pag. And I have been in love with languages for a long time. Uh, So at my first high school, I had two years of Spanish. We didn't learn much. We, uh, it was like a textbook. We only had class like twice a week. And then once a week, we would watch The Simpsons in Spanish with English subs. Um, And it wasn't really immersion, right? You've got subs and you're not actively like immersing. You're just reading the subs. and. Then we came back to the U.S., and my school in the U.S. had Japanese. So I was like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do Japanese. We used um, Japanese for young people textbooks. They were all in Kana. Um, I thought I was doing great. I even did Pimsler from the library. Like I checked it out, and I, I did Pimsler's level one and two. And at some point... I thought I was really good in this box, and then I realized I wasn't. I, I had some friends I played games with over Skype, and um, after talking to actual Japanese people, I realized my my 100-word vocabulary was not so great. So it really took me down <laughs> a peg. Uh, um, and I, I floundered around for a while. I found AJAT, and I did it totally wrong. I took everything wrong. I didn't do Anki. I didn't do SRS. I did binge listen to music. Uh, I took Katsumoto's advice about Rip Slime, and I listened to it religiously, thinking like, yeah, if I just listen to this uh, hip-hop in Japanese, I'm going to get fluent. And of course, when I eventually failed, um, I was like, okay, I'm no longer going to be a weeb. I hate Japanese. I can't learn it. And uh, at that point, I looked up the easiest language to learn for English speakers, and I found it was Afrikaans. So I said, okay, I'll give this a shot. I can learn another language. And I ordered a textbook from South Africa, from Kalahari.net. 
uh, had it shipped from South Africa to the middle of nowhere America. And it was a textbook for classes, like for a teacher, not meant for self-study. So that's another mistake I made. But I was able to like work through it. Afrikaans is gentle and easy. And uh, by the end of my journey with Afrikaans, I kind of was immersing. I was watching old uh, sitcoms on YouTube. And that was sort of like, it gave me confidence to start really like language learning. And um, yeah, I floundered around until eventually I uh, gave up language learning. At the time, I came back and I discovered like Refold and, and Mia was, oh, a few years ago, I was working for a Chinese company. And I was convinced that like, I like languages, I can learn Mandarin and then make more money. And that's a horrible reason to learn a language if you don't actually have to. You know, if you have, like, if you're learning English because you really, really need to, go for it. But if you're a, an American English speaker, like, learning another language just for your income, and you don't really like the culture, you're not super obsessed, you don't have friends or family, uh, you may not succeed. And I, of course, did not succeed. And I thought I was doing you know, uh, immersion learning, but I really wasn't. I was binging Anki. I was doing like two or three hours of Anki a day. And I was like immersing a little bit, but it was still the side piece. I was still sort of like caught in that vicious cycle of, I need to be doing flashcards. I need to be studying grammar. And uh, lo and behold, I never learned Mandarin. So uh, yeah, that's sort of how I discovered uh, Refold, I guess. I joined a um, knockoff mia server called mma mass mandarin approach and yeah as soon as uh, the official refold servers came out i joined on day one and that's my journey quite the journey yeah i have a lot Is of anything... regrets i'm ready to talk about the regrets <laughs> let's, let's talk about regret <laughs> same <Absolutely>. bestie <laughs> we're all here for each other this will be a wonderful <laughs> counseling session <laughs> where we can just get it all out <laughs> so many regrets well, uh yeah cool. well george you said you have so many regrets what's one of the things that you regret okay so going into immersion learning uh when i first started with mandarin i have a lot yeah. of regrets first off i should not have binged anki the way i did i have this mm -hmm. tendency to like start yeah. anki and do it for hours and hours a day um yeah me too it feels so productive it feels good in the beginning yeah and eventually you know, you can't sustain that if you're normal, you know, yeah. um, if you've got a job and other hobbies and stuff. And um, yeah, I just I wish I would have done less Anki and more immersion at the start of, yeah. of Mandarin. Um, and I definitely I would have focused more on phonology. Um, I've noticed that, like, comparing Mandarin to, say, Japanese... I feel totally subjective, like my listening comprehension in Japanese is already better than my listening comprehension in Mandarin, solely because I've not acquired tones. Um, so I still have a hard time parsing the language. So if I could go back over again with the first language I ever quote unquote refolded, I would have done less Anki, done more input, and I would have really studied the phonology from day one. Got you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. I did the same thing with Japanese. I burnt out. I was doing between like 20 and 30 new cards a day, maybe even more. I had several, I was addicted to finding decks on Anki web and adding them. Like so rewarding. I, I kept searching for the you get like these deck. dopamine spikes when you see, oh, this is a yes. great deck. And you get to this yes. sort of habit of like, and maybe listeners who are like sort of like linguophiles, language nerds know what I'm talking about. You get into this habit of like collecting resources and it gives you that dopamine spike. Like, yeah, I've it got does. one terabyte of all this, you know, textbooks and, and movies in the language. I'm doing great. And really you're not, right? You're you're, you're the illusion just, you're of productivity. Hoarder. The illusion of productivity. You're hoarding. You're a data hoarder <laughs> or a textbook hoarder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like it's like whenever mm -hmm. you go on YouTube and mm -hmm. it's like one of those videos like how I learned Italian in three months. And then you, nice. it's like a bunch of like slow panning shots of 15 different journals and really fancy pens. And it's like, oh, this is going to be great. <laughs> this is yeah. going to be a bad video for sure because they're just collecting pretty journals and not actually doing anything productive.
Yeah, that's true. That's what's kind of nice about emerging learning, though, is that I still get to collect, but it's like I'm collecting books. I'm collecting shows. You should see my <laughs> caliber library. I've done the same sort of hoarding. Uh, yeah. Now it's just for like fanfics and amateur books. <laughs> I love that. Um, cool. So I'd have so many fantasy books in Spanish is insane. On yeah, Kindle. But so Brie, what are your yeah. regrets with Spanish? I oh, I, I, I bet you have a few. So I have you, a few. You definitely drank the Kool-Aid about not outputting. How do you feel about that? I regret that. And I'm glad you asked. Um I drank the Kool-Aid begrudgingly. Um and I wish that I hadn't cared so much about it because, again, my goals aren't to be perfect. Um, to kind of like give you uh, insight into like what my goals are, what my life is like. You know, I'm in my mid 30s. I have a kid. I have a job, and I don't have all day to spend immersing. Um, and I am okay with just reaching really good high proficiency. I don't care about perfection, and. I still have output anxiety when it comes to outputting, which kind of makes my head spin. And I feel like, for example, like whenever I have italki lessons with my teacher, the first like five to 10 minutes are me just kind of like getting over that. And then I get into like a good flow. But in the beginning, I'm hyper aware of, of you know, the fact that I'm not saying things right. It's not perfect, um, which is kind of annoying. And another There's one of my big a regrets. community yeah, element to that as well. I've seen people who come yeah. into refold from like normal, like normie tier communities, and they suddenly yeah. become output phobic. So yeah. I, I feel like it's like a cultural disease of our little sort of immersion learning I will subculture. Say it, I'm also highly introverted, which probably doesn't help. <laughs> uh, immersion learning really appealed to my introvertedness where you know i love the idea of just reading all day and watching videos and not having to talk to anybody but you know at the end of the day language is communication and um you know like if i met someone in public i don't want to be scared like oh i'm really gonna mess up my my spanish i i don't want them to know that i'm not perfect at it you know i'm always so apologetic and in reality i have nothing to apologize for you know i am learning the best that i can this is my ability. I've been learning for a few years. I have very high comprehension, and I have a lot to learn. Would you say your goals have output. changed? And by the way, I think you're doing great. You've got a child. Thank you. you do you you teach, right? You do homeschooling. You've got a job. Yeah. You've got a husband. Yeah. You've got other hobbies, right? Uh, yeah. So I think you're doing fine for you know being an actual real human, I'm, not a neat. Yeah, uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> but would you say your goals have changed? Like when you came into Refold. Did you have that sort of mindset of I need to be better than native or you know what not? you know what's funny? I never had that goal. You never In had fact, that if goal. anything, my goals have gotten higher. My main goals, I was fine when I first started learning Spanish because again, I hadn't like totally gotten into immersion learning. um i I had known about it, and I was gonna do like, you know, age at light, you know, was kind of my plan mm -hmm. until I discovered full on m i a refold and joined those communities. Um, but my goal was I would have been fine just like caveman talking. That was really my main goal. I just wanted to know another language and be able to communicate a little bit. And the more that I learn, the more that I learned, the more I wanted to learn. Um, so it was actually kind of opposite for me, oddly enough. So other than the sort of the the output regret, like because you delayed yeah. outputting, do you have any other yeah. regrets? Would you have used Anki yes. as much or less? Would you have focused on dialect sooner? Or would have you... I know that you kind of settled on Spain and Mexico, kind of. Yeah, that was so... I want to say that my biggest regret, honestly, is not tracking my time. Uh, more specifically, not making progress updates. So a lot of people in the community, not a lot, but there are a fair amount of people that track their progress from the beginning, like Cloudy or Afro and other people that are learning. I wish I could remember everybody off the top of my head, but I'm always so amazed at seeing people's progress when they start like from month one or hour one and they make updates every month or every, uh, you know, 50 to 100 hours and seeing how they progress. Um, 
I think that documenting my journey, not for other people, but for myself would have been really nice because there are a lot of times where I feel like, man, I really haven't learned anything. But then when I rewatch something or reread something, I realize that I have read something. But to have that at your fingertips, seeing actual an actual evolution of your progress um, would be really cool. And then as far as dialect is concerned, I... It's more like I just wish I liked more stuff more from Latin, Latin America. Content. You know, like I, I like what I like, so I can't really regret liking stuff from Spain. I will say that, you know, I... No, no regrets really there. I mean, I did what I did, and I don't think it would change. ADHD is powerful, <laughs> so I have to follow what I'm interested in. But I did narrow it down to two dialects. Um and it is confusing sometimes when I'm talking with my teacher who's from Mexico and I say like a Spain, a Spain phrase. And she's like, that's got to be from Spain. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, please don't make fun of me. <laughs> but um, no real regrets on that front. Mostly like, you know, I, I wish I had tracked and I, I, I don't want to say I wish I didn't learn Japanese first. Um, because like, you know, now I'm a refolder because of it. And I've learned so much was like more so I have learned so much. What I'm doing now is already exceeding my expectations and my original goals, which says a lot. Which like is just I, I just off. finished, I just finished an 835 page book and I read was probably a hundred pages Sando? today. No, it was by was Sarah not. J Moss. Oh. No. And it was like translated by uh, it's translated in Mexican Spanish too with a Mexican uh, narrator and audible. And yeah, like, you know, I'm like reading books left and right. I'm having a good time, you know, so that's awesome. I do regret though, not being easier on myself though, about outputting for sure. How about you? And not tracking. Do you have any regrets you want to walk us through? Well, um, aside from wanting to build a time machine and go back to when I was a teenager and find age at, Yes, me too. Me too. Um, <laughs> aside, because I would have been fluent by now. Oh my god! Right? Uh, but okay. uh, aside from that, um, I wish. So I kind of did a little too much Anki, I think, in the beginning too. Um, like I, I really crammed the one K deck. So when I came into refold, it was still V one of the JP one K. So. I was like cramming 50 cards a day on the wow. on JP1K. 50 cards a day. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then when I was halfway through it, I dropped it down to a more like reasonable number. Um, but yeah, I just regret really trying to speed run and cram mm -hmm. the vocab in the beginning because yeah. I'm finding that I'm having to relearn a lot of words. How long so, did you like try to speed run for? Um, I feel like I can't remember. I was doing like 50 cards a day, so it was probably like a month and a half or two months that I was like halfway through V1, yeah. probably. Yeah. Clarify, you ended up That's doing all bad. of V1 and V2 of the JP1. I did all of yeah, I did all of V1, and then when I was about to finish V1, V2 came out, and I was like, ah. Uh, okay, I guess I'm kind of doing <laughs> that too. <laughs> oh, wow. So I got V2 and I was just like suspending words I already knew from V1. So I ended up like suspending half of V2. How did that feel though doing that? Like suspending the cards that you already knew? I I liked it because it felt like it was going yeah. faster than the first time. Yeah, also you get to like, yeah, psh, whatever. I know that. Psh, yeah. I remember that. And I That's felt like cool. it was kind of like a... a a small perfectionist mindset kind of thing. Like it's like, no, I have to know all the words. So I didn't want to like miss anything yeah. in the in the two decks. Cause I know there were some differences in, in the words. So Chiki, you are stage two C and uh -huh. you've not really started reading. You read manga now and then, but it's not like reading, yeah. reading. You've not gotten into light novels. Uh mm -hmm. do you have any regrets about waiting so long to like try mm. reading? There are some times where I'm annoyed with my reading ability, like where it is. Like, I'm not totally illiterate. I can read okay. But um, there are some times where I'm annoyed. Um, but 
uh, uh, yes and no, because I'm just like following my interests. And yeah, I'm like reading is kind of like on the back burner as far as like getting good at it is like on the back burner because I would rather be conversational and then and then expand my vocabulary from there. Interesting. I feel yeah. like the people who get into reading really early in Japanese always do really well. Um, yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> I all, know all roads but... <laughs> lead to Rome. All immersion leads to fantasy, yeah. hopefully. Mm -hmm. So I see that Soup has joined us. Uh, are you with us, Soup? Uh, I think so. Well, do you want to yeah. give a brief, brief introduction? And then uh, we can ask you about your journey. <laughs> uh, okay. I am in one of the admins in the Japanese server and the server, even though I notice we have quite a few in here now. It's a side note. <laughs> um, I've been learning Japanese for exactly three years and four days on the dot now. Um, and yeah. And you started out, I guess, how? How did you start like your Japanese journey? Was it with immersion learning right from the bat? Oh, so you want to go back that far. Um, I actually did traditional learning for about a month until I found, what was it, Brit versus Japan, I think. And then through his channel, I found Matt's channel. And then through that, I found a uh, whole MIA sort of um, website thing. Um, and I got immersion learning that way. Uh, so, yeah. I started off watching anime for like a year. Uh, working on listening only. And then I got into reading heavily for what was like two years so yeah, yeah. And at your your peak you were reading like eight hours a day you've read several hundred books i think in japanese at this point uh yes so and no <laughs> i guess you yeah. do have some regrets maybe i don't want to assume i know that you've been doing this output practice so you waited several years to like really start getting into the conversational domain and outputting um and i mm -hmm. noticed that it's helped your Japanese, right? You what used to take 150 characters now takes half the amount, right, to express yourself. <laughs> yeah. So, do you have any regrets um, not sort of getting into converse, you know, conversing sooner? I uh, not really, mainly because I never really had the desire to sort of converse um, until like I don't know six months ago or something. So at the time when I was reading as much as I was, you know, I didn't really like, I don't know. I was really enjoying myself and I thought I never would really have any attention to really get good at output basically. Um, but yeah, I don't really regret waiting as long as I have, because even though my writing isn't perfect, um, it didn't take long for it to get to where it is now, which is like a sitting between a B2 and a C1 level. So now is after like two weeks of writing or something. I guess so two or three weeks. Do you but... have any regrets? It can be anything. It can be from waiting to output, which you said you don't regret. Anything that you would have wished you had learned oh. sooner, or maybe yeah. choosing a dialect, uh, any bad habits that you're working off, any sort of regrets? Oh, okay. Yeah, some more general. Um, definitely not focusing as much as I could have on pitch acts in the beginning. Um, but also at the time, it wasn't like... Uh, like a super common idea, I guess, to really hone in on be being able to perceive pitch accents from the get-go, even though, yeah, it's probably common sense if you think about it. But at the time, I was also not really concerned with having perfect accent. And I, I'm still not, to a degree, but it would have saved me a lot of time that I would... Uh, or rather, it, it would have saved me a lot of time now had I done that from the beginning. Uh, in terms of anything else, uh, I don't think so, no. So it sounds like phonology is something that a lot of people do not put a lot of focus on in the beginning. It, it seems like a common thread that people regret it later. Um, with me, I really regret not focusing on Mandarin tones. A lot of Japanese yeah. learners regret not focusing on pitch accent. Yeah, I actually do regret not like specific. I was thinking about your question of, you know, do you regret not outputting sooner? And I think I more so regret not shadowing and not just repeating after things as I was listening to things casually and trying to like imitate accents and do things like that earlier. I think I did Pimsleur early on um, with Spanish as well. Um, but I only did like maybe 20 lessons or so, but 
if it's not easy for me to to make the sounds correctly, even though you think, oh, it's just Spanish. But Spanish is, you know, completely different. The vowels are completely different than English and the way things are said. So. I'll be I honest. I rely on grammar different. tool, language tool, language tool. I rely on language tool to put my stress yeah. accents in Spanish when I type. Yeah. So uh, clearly I have not acquired Spanish uh, stress. Yeah, it's, it's hard, so, especially because I read so much, you know, so I don't really hear it that much. So I feel like I wish I would have maximized the stuff that I did listen to, you know. All right, I understand. Yeah, and hmm, it sounds like we have a lot of, like, different types of regrets. So, Sin, how about dialects? Have you gotten into any Japanese dialects? uh in what way well it seems like a lot of people end up getting into um i guess sort of the kansai dialect it seems fairly popular among Mm. japanese learners Uh, i guess because there's so much media right like comedy so on and so forth Mm. uh personally i don't really like actively pursue any dialects besides uh like the non-standard one um or besides the standard one rather um but I do find dialects really interesting, and I always make note of whenever I come and come across like a new, uh, like a, what's the word? Like a, <laughs> I can't think of it. Um, any anything that looks like non-standard, I sort of make note of it, and then do my own research to see what it is and sort of, um, what well, else comes with it. I guess so to speak. So whatever dictionary I don't like, I'm using with Yomi Chan tells me when a word is dialectal. Yeah. So I notice uh, oh. the two most common dialectal words that do pop up are either Kanto or Kansai. Um, oh, that's cool. I yeah. didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, I noticed there was a sentence final particle, he. Um, then it, mm. it was labeled as uh, Kanto dialect. I noticed that this morning. So I thought that was... Oh, funny. that's pretty neat. Yeah, I didn't know about that. Yeah, so it sounds like the Japanese learners don't have that many regrets, Brie. Wow. Yeah. How? That's, I mean, I guess it sounds like Sin, though, like, kind of jumped in, knowing what his goals were, had an idea of what immersion was pretty quickly. And Shiki said she wished she had a time machine because she did try learning Japanese. To be a a teen again. I think we would all take that. You know, I've seen the amazing progress that some of our teen uh, refold members make. And it's insane. it's amazing. I wish I had it's... not played so much World of Warcraft or League of Legends when I was a teen. Yeah, that's my regret. I wish I didn't play so much League of Legends in my uh, early twenties, <laughs> and instead focused all of that time when I actually had time on language learning. Because uh, I never got good at League of Legends, but you know, I have um, I have regrets about not starting earlier. But at the same time, I started at a very a uh, convenient time where there were a lot of people who have done what I'm trying to do, like in the past. So I was yeah. able to examine their process and see their mistakes. And I've kind of streamlined my process to be efficient from the start. So yeah. it doesn't really introduce a lot of regrets. Yeah. So does anybody Starting here have like, like any system. bad habits though? Like, is there anything that kind of maybe you could have done differently to avoid? Mm. I'm not sure. Because I waited a long time to do the monolingual transition, and I don't know if that's a regret I have or not. Wait, you, you are you still time. doing the monolingual transition? Because last I heard, you were not a fan. You didn't believe in it. Uh, so, like, so I, out of laziness on my Kindle, it had it was set to Spanish. So the words that were easy to read the definition in Spanish, it was fine. Um, I do, I have come kind of not a total 180, but what's nice about looking things up monolingually is that you don't have to take yourself out of your target language mindset when you're looking things up. So you, you're still in that mindset. And it's, if you think of it kind of like a train with momentum, like you're not breaking that like target language momentum that you have in your head. Um, 
Whereas with uh, bilingual lookups, it's easy because you get back into the action faster, but it every time you step away from your target language, it, it kind of makes it harder to spool back up, I think. That said, in the last hundred pages of this book that I read, I did not bother with monolingual lookups because I had a plot to find out, I had an ending to read, and I had no time <laughs> for the for the monolingual stuff. Like every time I, I stopped at a word, I thought, oh, I really don't want to look this up. I just want to find out what happens. Um, so and what I feel like that's kind of like, a good place to be. What caused you to change your opinion on the monolingual transition? Having experienced it. Isn't that lame? <laughs> Having experienced it. Um, it. First, it started out of curiosity, like, can I do this? And when the answer was, yeah, for 95% of the words, you can do this. And for like the other 5%, a monolingual, a monoling, a bilingual lookup makes more sense. Because I do think that there are some words where it just makes more sense. Because when you're they're, like, they're describing they're like a circular. bipedal animal... A bipedal animal who lives in the grass who eats this type of grub. It's like I don't know. Like, so have have you anything. ever noticed like where it gives you a synonym instead of an actual proper definition, and then you look at the synonym and you don't know it either? Yeah, or it just says like it'll be a word, and it's like the act of doing the same word but as a verb. So the nice thing about Kindle on like an iPad or your phone is that you can open up the full dictionary and then look up the words in the dictionary itself. So when the book isn't as like enticing, I, I'll take the time to do that to kind of stay in the Spanish headspace or whatever. But when the book is popping off and I've got to find out who killed who and the whole world is in flames, um, if I don't get it on the first pass of the of the monolingual lookup, I'll just look up a bilingual a, a bilingual dictionary because I don't have any time. But yeah, I think it's good to do it. I kind of see it, as but like, not be militant about it. Yeah, you know, I I kind of see it as like an extra challenge for you. Like if you feel like um, you're understanding words really well when you do the bilingual lookups, um, trying to look them up in the monolingual first before you go to the bilingual one it's like an extra exercise for your brain to try to like figure it out more through context instead of just giving yourself the answer right away yeah i agree so shiki have you started the monolingual transition yet in japanese yeah i have um i think like two or three monolingual dictionaries prioritized first in my uh, pop-up dictionary and then I have the English one, like, um, fourth. So if I feel like... I try to read the monolingual definition, and then if I don't get it, I'll go to the English one. All right. And but I'm not it, like... Let's reel it back in here for I'm, a sec. Does anybody have any sort of, like, habits from their immersion learning that have been harmful, like, to the rest of their life? So I see this a lot in the oh. community. People who are like... A lot of people who get into refold and immersion learning are already sort of like homebodies. And then they, yeah. they now have a new outlet to justify never leaving their room, right? And it's not yeah. always healthy to stay at home. Sometimes you do need to like go out, uh, touch grass, get some sunlight. And have you guys noticed any sort of like negative effects of immersion learning? Yes. Yes. Yes, I have. And it's something that I try to balance. Um, so... A lot of the reason, not all of it, there are several reasons that I'm trying to learn a language. One of them is that I have a small child who is five years old, and I want her to learn Spanish, acquire Spanish, however you want to say it, at an early age. So I've been trying just to get to a point where I would be good enough to assist her on her journey and hopefully spark a love of language learning. That is yet to be determined. We'll see how that goes. Um, but I don't like that sometimes I find myself saying, no, not right now, baby. Mommy's busy doing X, Y, Z, like reading her book or something. And while, you know, it's okay to have hobbies and it's okay to, you know, have alone time and teach your children to have, you know, their own time alone. There are times when I wish I just put down the book or whatever I was watching and just hung out with her. And so lately, I've actually been trying to limit 
the amount that I've been immersing in a day um, and trying to really engage in the moment of the day. Because when you're lost in a book or a movie, it's easy to get in that space and forget that like real life exists. Um, and I think it's really important to understand that you're learning a language to hopefully enhance your life, not take away from it. And like all things, you know, I think balance is something that is underappreciated in so, these circles. But yeah. that could just be me. I'm I'm the type of person I think I think I'm just a huge weirdo because I'm the type of person who would be perfectly happy to stay inside my apartment for months at a time, oh, not me step too. outside and just like just immerse. Yes. Um <laughs> me too but yeah uh but like when i started i started school uh last semester and i was trying to still balance my immersion in between my school workload uh pretty much a full time college workload of homework and i was not really getting good grades like as good as they could be if i was entirely focused on the classwork instead of trying to fit the immersion in as well because like at the end of the day that's really what i want to be doing like i don't want to be writing the same kanji five times for my stupid japanese 101 class i want to be watching youtube and stuff like that but um i was just scared of losing you know the hard work i've put in up until that point do you yeah. find that immersion cuts into like your your school and the rest of your life yeah, I mean, well, not in like a negative way, because I'm perfectly happy to be prioritizing immersion. But like, I like in reality, I can't, which makes me frustrated. Gotcha. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I do regret that I uh, am not a teen. <laughs> you know, if I could definitely go back and just binge watch anime all day, I would. Uh you know, I think a lot of us real, feel that though. way. Um, <laughs> For real. Uh, so, so Shiki, you work full time pretty much, and you also go to college. How many hours of immersion do you get in a week? Mm, probably around ten ish, if I'm lucky. Okay, that seems reasonable. Ten with a full time yeah. job and university. Mm hmm. Good balanced amount. Yeah, I would like more, of course. Sure, of course. That's a good. That's a that's a good chunk, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ten seems to be about normal. I think for people who are like working adults who have other things going on. Mm -hmm. What about you, Gorg? How many how many hours are you getting? I do not track. Um, <laughs> I've tried Bad about, about yeah about two weeks ago. I tried to get back into to time tracking. Mm -hmm. And I was on that horse for about two days before I just stopped time tracking. Um, I have ADHD, PI, so I tend to hop in and out of things. And I just found it difficult to constantly uh, disengage, start the timer, stop yep. the timer. Yes. Um, so I really, I need to find a workaround. I really, I, that's something I do regret is uh, when it comes to like Spanish and Filipino, I never tracked my time. You know, I can give yeah. like a year time frame year time frames are not that great right yeah. hours and minutes is where um time tracking really shines right because it's you can do true. 35 hours a week and then your one year of immersion is quite good or you can do one hour a week and then but you can still say oh i'm not fluent after five years but really you only have so many hours right so exactly um big regrets on not tracking not documenting not using spreadsheets. Uh, I'm just not that type of person, though. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I definitely feel you on that. I wish that I had found something that made sense as far as tracking was concerned. Because I have the same issue where I would get, like, this weird paralysis where I would want to track something and then I would zone out or I would get interrupted because my kid wanted goldfish or something and then I had to put the phone down for 30 seconds and I just never really knew like how much to track um it's 
kind of weird thinking about it recently because I've been reading on my phone. I found that my phone has, uh, it tells me how long I spend in each app. And so whereas my YouTube and my Netflix are generally bilingual, I use them for both, I exclusively read in Spanish. So I've been able to see kind of on a daily basis how long I've been reading which is really cool. I've never had that before. <laughs> what's your like what's your daily average? Uh, let's see. Let me pull up my phone. Today was crazy cuz we've reached like the climax of my book. Um and oh god. I'm okay. Today is embarrassing. <laughs> Not really, but I read for 6 hours today. It didn't feel like that, but I read I woke up at 6 a.m. and I read a lot. Um and then let's see. But generally, it's between, like, an hour and 30 minutes and two hours. But I'm also really excited about this feature. So I don't know how long that will last as far as uh, reading is concerned. How long have you been sort of maintaining that sort of hour and a half, two hour pace? Since I got my new phone. <laughs> Since and I discovered when, when was that? I don't remember. When did I get when did I message you excited that I got a new phone? Uh, uh two weeks ago, maybe? Two or so three. So about two weeks. Two weeks. Uh, this book is also really good. So the book that I'm reading is also really good. I go through dry spells too, where like I just can't stomach anything that I'm reading and nothing can fill the place of the last book and there's like this empty hole, you know. Um but I don't really track watching stuff because i get so distracted i'm always looking away i'm always zoning out but reading for me is really pure because if i'm making progress in the book it is me it's not like passive it's like me actively reading it um but yeah i'm in the same boat long story short i wish i was able to track my time because people like afro they have a log like he has a log of you know 100 hour update 150 hour update and he has them on youtube and he'll be able to look back and say exactly what he was able to do after doing immersion for x amount of hours which i just find amazing yeah i do like it when refolders give me their their hour count you know this is where my russian is this is where my chinese is after so many hours yeah. um i wish i could say how many hours i have been immersing immersing for sure i i, I have no idea so, guys, we're going to actually wrap it up a little bit early today. Uh, before we go, thank you all for coming to the live recording of the podcast. It'll be out on YouTube and Spotify in the next few days, so keep an eye on it. And, yeah, voting is going to open for next week. So go ahead and re-suggest any topics that got passed over, didn't win the vote in uh, the prior weeks. And, yeah, I'll see you guys uh, next week, hopefully. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Refold Podcast. We hope you enjoyed listening and maybe even learned something new. Projects, events, and content like this podcast are only possible thanks to our generous patrons. If you liked this and want to see more similar projects, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Visit community.refold.la slash patreon-benefits to learn more.